it gives me profound, profound pleasure to introduce to you a man who I like to entitle a quintessential mensch of a human being. <laughs> mensch means gentleman in Yiddish. Um, Frank Gaffney Jr., who has, um, he is the founder and president of a wonderful organization called the Center for Security Policy. Um, Frank has done everything he can to make sure that we never lose our moral clarity and our moral focus and that all of us remember what a special nation the United States is and can be once again. Um, Frank has written everywhere on the Wall Street Journal, um, frontpagemag.com. He is the author of several books um, and um, a, just a, a wonderful, wonderful dear friend, colleague, and great, great American. It's my profound pleasure to introduce you to Frank Gaffney, Jr. The moving mic is going to be adjusted yet again. <laughs> Bear with us. Um, good afternoon. It's great to be with you and with uh, wonderful friends um, and uh, many of you in the audience who I would categorize in the same, the same way. Um, Deborah Burlingame is about as hard an act to follow as you get, um, in part because so few people um, exemplify the sort of courage that she has brought and dignity and clarity to the challenges of our time. And um, so I'm gonna try not to uh, uh, so much follow as amplify on some of the points that she made and then drill down into um, a specific facet of the problem that uh, Sarah's asked me to address both in the book and, um, and here with you today. Uh, speaking of shameless promotion of books, we just <laughs> happened to have one of the ones that uh, she was alluding to. It's called Sharia, the Threat to America. I, I really commend it to you, not so much because I had anything to do with it, but because um, 18 other really terrific national security professionals helped put it together. And they're among the most eminent experts in the particular field that I want to talk with you about, um, which is the intersection between our civilization, our interests, our security, and something that its adherents call, as Deborah mentioned a moment ago, Sharia. What is Sharia? Sharia is a political, military, and legal doctrine. It's often simply described as Sharia law. It has to do with the law, for sure. But it's really a much more comprehensive program that dictates how all aspects of a Muslim's life must be governed. And for that matter, all non-Muslims as well. And that's where the political and military come in. It is about imposing this program, this doctrine on the entire world. And in fact, Sharia commands its adherents to engage in jihad to that end. It's not simply something they're encouraged to do, they're obliged to do it. And if they can't do it themselves by picking up the sword or strapping on the suicide vest, they are nonetheless still compelled to support jihad. And I'm gonna come back in a moment to talk about one of the ways in which they are financing the jihad. But let me just stay with this basic broader point. Deborah has movingly chronicled down to the body part one of the manifestations of jihad, the preferred manifestation of jihad, namely violence, terrifying violence. This was exemplified in Muhammad's own personal tradition and practice. And since he was the perfect Muslim and the model for Sharia, it is what others are commanded to do. But it is a practical program, this Sharia business. 
Muhammad himself, again, in his personal experience, demonstrated that where violence would be impracticable or perhaps even counterproductive temporarily, it's okay to eschew it in favor of another kind of jihad. Robert Spencer has coined the phrase stealth jihad, which is very descriptive. The Muslim Brotherhood in the uh, explanatory memorandum Deborah mentioned a moment ago, its strategic plan introduced into evidence, as she said, in the Holy Land Foundation trial, calls it civilization jihad. But whether it's stealth jihad or civilization jihad or anything else you wish to describe it as, it is every bit as dangerous to societies like ours as is the violent kind. I would argue, in fact, it's more dangerous because we're reasonably alive to the danger, at least post 9-11, that others who wish to use planes or truck bombs or suicide vests or sniper rifles or the like can inflict upon us. What we have been largely ignorant of, shamefully so, when it comes to our government, is this other piece, the stealthy civilization jihad, perpetrated most especially by the Muslim Brotherhood. And that's all the more extraordinary since we know from their own materials and documents and teachings that the Muslim Brotherhood's objectives are exactly the same as the group they spawn. Al-Qaeda, establishing Sharia worldwide and having the world governed by a caliph who will rule according to Sharia. Exactly the same objectives, just different methodologies. And not entirely different methodologies, and this is really a key point. When you hear not far from this very room, the senior most intelligence officer of the United States government described the Muslim Brotherhood as a, quote, largely secular organization that has eschewed violence and is now engaged in charitable good works. He's missing one small point. I mean, aside from that identicality of objectives point with Al Qaeda, he's missing the point that actually it's more accurate to describe the Muslim Brotherhood's techniques as pre-violent than non-violent. Because after all, what they are about is using them to advance the objectives that Sharia directs them to pursue until that point where violence, the preferred approach, is no longer impracticable. So even those who believe that we can safely imbue in the Muslim Brotherhood a legitimacy, a partnership status, uh, become the vehicle for our outreach with the Muslim American community, for example, or turn over a strategic nation like Egypt to them. They're missing this small point. Well, in addition to that other one, that it's doing exactly the same thing as Al-Qaeda, namely, that it will do it through nonviolent means only up to the point where it can usefully, productively, effectively, decisively use violence. So let me just drill down for a moment on a point that Deborah made, which is that the nonviolent agenda of the Muslim Brotherhood in furtherance of Sharia in a pre-violent phase of their operations in the United States and elsewhere in the Western world is, as she said, to conduct intensive influence operations. And she enumerated a number of the ways in which this is done, to penetrate government agencies, the military, the intelligence community, the Congress. Do you know that not far from this room, again, one of the guests of the Congressional Muslim Staffers Association back in 2002, the lead cleric, imam of their 
weekly prayer service was a fellow by the name of Anwar Alawaki, currently on the killer capture list, wanted for running terrorist operations out of Yemen against this country. But at the time was, well, I think frankly, running terrorist operations out of Dar al-Hidra Mosque, not far from here. Of all of the influence operations that the Muslim Brotherhood and its friends and associates are engaged in at the moment, I personally believe the single most insidious for capitalist Western democracies like ours is something that they call the adherence to Sharia, Sharia compliant finance. We have in this book, if you care to grab it, it's at Amazon. I did mention this book, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's at Amazon. You can actually get it online for free uh, at shariathethreat.com. But the second appendix is required reading. That's the explanatory memorandum Deborah and I have talked about in its entirety. If you can't read anything else, just read those 12 pages or so. It tells you really everything you need to know about the Brotherhood, its agenda, its modus operandi, and actually they helpfully enumerate 29 of the groups they describe as their organizations or organizations of their friends. By the way, every prominent Muslim American organization in the country today that was in existence in 1991 when this document was written is still in business, still active, still being used for Muslim outreach, and yet they were identified by the Muslim Brotherhood as their organizations. 